So we are three weeks in to our Wisdom for Life series. This book has been all about the book of Proverbs. Uh, Proverbs, what I love about Proverbs is that it looks at the duality, duality, between duplicity, whatever, of what we want to do and what is good and right, and then what we don't want to do. So it's like two sides of a coin. You know, you have the wise and you have the fool. Hmm. You have the pure and you have the impure. And it's back and forth, back and forth. If you read it, it's like this, 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 this. And there's another scripture in the New Testament. I don't think it's going to go up on the screens, but Paul is talking. And he says, I, you know, I want to do the good things. By the power of the Spirit, I want to do the good things. But I find myself doing the things I hate. You know, because there really is. There's a sin nature, which is that flesh nature. And then there's the life by the Spirit. And we're caught in between both. And Proverbs talks about it so Well, uh, so a couple weeks ago, if you've been following us with this series last week, we talked about the generous and the greedy. And we looked at what Proverbs goes back and forth between being generous and being greedy and what that looks like. Next week, we're going to talk about the wise and the fool. So the difference between wisdom and foolishness. But today, today we're going to talk about the proud and the humble. (laughs) This is going to be so much fun. We get to talk about pride, people. We all got it. I don't care who you are. We all have it. And it's going to be good. But I wanted, now that we're three weeks into the series, what I wanted to do is I wanted to start the message with just a little bit of encouragement before we start looking at the proud and the humble. Because the truth is, if you're in the room today and you would say that you're a Christian, you're, you're covered by the blood of Jesus, you're leaning in, you recognize him as Lord and Savior, and you're doing the work to become a mature Christian, uh, you know, ruled by, by the, the law of the Spirit, then the truth is that Jesus makes us white as snow. So while we have sin, when we confess that before the Lord and we acknowledge Jesus, we stand before God the Father white as snow. That's what the word says. That is the truth. And so what happens with that is God does not stamp us. God does not stamp his legitimate children with a label of being impure. He doesn't stamp us with a label of being greedy. He doesn't stamp us with a label of being prideful. And he doesn't stamp us with a label of being foolish. That's not how he sees us in Christ. In Christ, he sees us as Jesus is. And Jesus is none of those things. He's the complete opposite of all those things. But what happens is, is that we still sometimes operate. We operate in pride. We operate in foolishness. We operate in greed or we operate in lust. When you look at the, another encouragement, when you look at the whole of scripture, we see that those who have put their faith in Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior, they become the righteousness of God in Christ. So the scripture says they become the righteousness of God in Christ, which means that when the father looks at his children, he sees the blood of Jesus on us. And that blood of Jesus is what makes us white as snow. And so my question, an encouragement up front, but a question to you. As we, as we go through this and as we continue with the Proverbs series, do you see, see yourself as God sees you? Do you see, when you see both sides of the coin and you're in the middle of it, but do you see yourself as God sees you? And are you leaning into the truth of what he sees and says about you? Because, you know, that person, they grew up and they, they were always told that they're doing it wrong. <laughs> they're always told they're doing it wrong. They don't have any faith that they can do it right. And so as we hear the good news of Christ, if we don't believe that we can do it right, we might not lean in or engage. We might not have that hope or faith for our life. So I want to encourage you. That's who God says you are. And so lean into what he says about you. You can do it right by the power of the spirit. We also see that he has given us his spirit, the Holy Spirit as a deposit or a guarantee. When you look at the whole scripture, that he is coming back for us. And what the spirit does is he brings with him his own nature. The spirit of the living God brings his nature to our lives. That fruit of love, that fruit of joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and self-control. So again, I'm going to lean in with some questions as we navigate this. Do you know that promise? Is it for you in your life? Do you believe when you gave your life to Jesus that he gave you his spirit as a deposit, a guarantee? He brought the fullness of his presence into your life and he wishes to deliver more and more and more as you lean into him because if we try and get things right in our own strength if we try and get things right through our own ability our own understanding our own knowledge then it's an uphill climb with very little joy (laughs) anybody know what I'm talking about where you just tried and tried and it's like all the joy gets sucked out of you because you're trying so hard but it's in your own strength and it's the spirit that gives life 
And so if we know the promise that the spirit is with us, we find life as we lean in. So knowing the spirit of the living God is within us and he gives us his qualities, it changes how we operate. It's the same stuff, but it changes our internal dialogue about how we do it and what we believe is possible. And then last encouragement before we jump in, there's the admonition for us in scripture that to live by the spirit and not by the flesh. For the flesh or that sin nature brings only what is destructive, while the spirit brings only what is life. So this isn't a question, but I'm going to ask you if you know that charge. This is something, do you know it? And are you living by it? Because God has made us right with him. That's the promise. God has made us right with him. He has made us clean. But the part we play, and this is where it becomes, it's not just God, it's us too. But it's not in our own strength. The part we play is in the choices that we make. Okay. So we either operate in the flesh or we operate according to the spirit. You can't do both. You can't please the spirit and please the flesh at the same time. One of them's grumpy. <laughs> you know, like you're either angering the flesh or you're grieving the spirit. You can't do both at the same time. So in our choices, we decide whether I'm grieving the spirit or I'm angering the flesh. One of those is happening. You're cutting and slicing through it. Okay, so we, we operate in those things so we can make, and this is why we can be believers, sons and daughters of God most high, but we can make a pure choice one moment and an impure choice the next, <laughs> ah, or just with one person. You know what I mean? We can be generous with one person and we can be greedy with someone else. And then we can be humble in one context and we can be outrageously prideful in another. So when you look at your life, it just depends on the choices that we're making. So we come back to the theme uh, kind of statement for the scripture is wisdom is not just knowing right and wrong, but it's applying it. To your life. So that's the first blank you're taking notes. Wisdom is not just knowing right and wrong, but it's applying it to your life. And we apply it in our choices and we apply it through our beliefs and letting the Lord kind of change that. So the good news is, guys, the good news is this. When you find yourself on the wrong side of where you want to be, it is so simple to correct it. So simple that is. If you can humble yourself before the Lord, confess that sin and then turn from it and to the way of the Lord instead. It's a very simple process, but it does require humility. And so that's what we're going to talk about. Let's talk about the proud and the humble. Are you guys ready? All right. So it'll follow the same kind of stuff as before. We're talking about the proud person first. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. The proud person consistently has conflict or the proud consistently have conflict. <laughs> Let's look at it. Okay. Proverbs 13, 10 says this. Where there is strife, there is pride, but wisdom is found in those who take advice. So I wanted to define strife because who in the world uses that language? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> what the heck is it? Okay. Strife is equal to these three things. Contention, debate, and quarrel. Contention, debate, and quarrel. And pride, because we hear the word pride, but let's give a little bit more context and definition to it. Pride is equal to these insolence. Nobody uses that word either. And arrogance, insolence and arrogance. Okay, so I was, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set this up. And I was going to say this. I was going to say key clues that someone is operating in pride is, but let's be real here. We're not looking to point the finger or shove the elbow at the person sitting next to us. Okay, what we're looking to do is see the places where we are operating in pride, shine the mirror at ourself and go, okay, these are the places where the Lord wants to deal with me. So it's not someone else is operating in pride. These are key clues that we are operating in pride. Okay, so key clues that you are operating in pride are these, being in contention with another person. Further describe that, it means being in a heated disagreement and or a competition to win or succeed at the other person's loss. Anybody married or have kids? Okay, you're in pride every other day. <laughs> okay, you're in a heated disagreement or a competition to win or succeed at their loss. You are operating in pride. If you find yourself in a debate with someone about who is right and you need to win. If you need to win, you're operating in pride. <laughs> okay. Or, or here's another one. You're in pride if you're in a quarrel with someone about something that you just won't let go of. Okay. 
Okay, you don't need to raise your hand. You don't need, you guys are really quiet, but I feel like this is all of you every day because it's me every day, all right? And maybe I'm just the worst of all of you, but nobody raise your hand, shove your neighbor. We, we know we're all guilty of those things. A prideful person, and here's the difference, a prideful person consistently finds themselves in that place. They are always there, and so they always have conflict. Where someone operating in pride, covered by the blood of Jesus, but you find yourself operating in pride, so you're choosing the flesh over the spirit, you will occasionally find yourself in that place. But the good news is, remember, if you can see it, then you can confess it and you can turn from it. You can move from the wrong side to the right side by humbling yourself, saying, okay, I was operating in pride in that moment. And then you confess and you go in a different direction. Okay, there's another scripture talking about conflict. Proverbs 22.10 it says, drive out the mock and out goes strife quarrels and insults are ended okay so here's another thing about the prideful person the prideful person is also referred to as a mocker in scripture okay in the proverbs the mocker you guys know what a mocker does they push the buttons of everybody around them and they rage against sound judgment anything good and right the mocker is like they are you know they're annoying right they're the people who just drive you up the wall okay they 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 rage against sound judgment they don't receive any counsel they don't operate in obedience and they don't have humility towards the lord or anybody else so in the presence of the mocker someone who operates like that there is strife there is contention there is quarreling and insults abound so if you're hanging out with someone or you are the, the someone because we're looking at ourselves, we're the mirror we're, look, we're shining the scripture which is the mirror we're looking at ourselves. if you're operating those things it's pride so it's possible guys <laughs> that there are some mockers in your life like you could survey your life and go mocker 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 and if they were driven out because it says drive out the mocker and i'll go stripes you're like oh y'all just gotta go i'm cutting you off bye like it's possible that you could do that and maybe there are some people who they're they're consistently operating in pride so it is not good for them to be in your life in this season but it's also possible that you are the mocker <laughs> and that that mocking spirit is what needs to be driven out so there's a mocking spirit which you have given permission to let you rage, to let you not have counsel, to let you not take advice, to let you like operate in needing to win. It's possible that there's a mocking spirit that needs to be driven out. When I say mocking spirit, now everybody might be a little bit weird. Like, Ooh. that's not what I'm talking about. The, the way that we can, we, we get rid of a mocking spirit is simply this. You see it. You confess it, Lord, I see that I'm operating like a mocker. Scripture says it like this, and I see that in my life. So I agree with your assessment of that. I see that I have, I have had a mocking spirit. And so I give it to you, and I instead want to turn from it and to your way of life instead. That's how you drive out a mocking spirit. It's very simple. It's very basic. It's confession and repentance and turning. Okay, so number two um, about the proud person, the proud, they strive to keep their image. You can write this down. A proud person strives to keep their image, which means a proud person has to work really hard all the time in order to get other people the way they want other people to see them. You know what I mean? Like there's an image that they want to keep up and they have to work really hard to get others to buy into it. Listen to these scriptures. Proverbs 3:34. He mocks proud mockers, but shows favor to the humble and oppressed. I love this. Proverbs 15, 25. The Lord tears down the house of the proud, but he sets the widow's boundary stones in place. And then Proverbs 16, 5. The Lord detests the proud of heart. Be sure of this. They will not go unpunished. Okay, so the proud person, this is what we're seeing. The proud person, they cannot see it, but they are in a constant battle against the Lord constant battle against the Lord. And he, he wins every single time he wins. I mean, God's not going to let the proud person stand. He wins. So a proud person is in a constant battle with the Lord. So this is what happens. If you're in a consistent battle with the Lord, because I've read these scriptures before and I've thought of people, you know what I mean? And I'm like, they don't look destroyed to me. <laughs> they look like they're thriving. Okay. And it's making me a little bit angry. You right? like destroy them. But as I'm considering this, the, okay. So destroying if he tears down the house of the proud, that's internal. That's an internal thing that the Lord is doing. The Lord tears down the house of the proud. And so listen to this, the prideful person 
as an internal struggle of needing people on the outside to validate them. They need others to see them and they need other people to praise them. And this is why, because a sense of security does not exist within them. If the Lord is tearing down the house of the pride, there is no security within that person. There's nothing secure or sure within them. And so they have to look for it outside of themselves because God is not going to put that in them. And I love this. God does not let the proud win because pride, it sets itself up against the knowledge and the provision of God. And the Lord tears that down. Pride, this is why, because pride robs the proud person of any sense of assurance or security. And the Lord does that on purpose. Let me tell you, this This is probably going to be one of the most difficult things I'm going to tell you today. And I know it's difficult because I have, I have been through it, but chances are, let's make this a little bit personal. The places of insecurity in your life, the places where you struggle or feel insecure about something are probably linked to a place where you're trying to keep up some image or you're trying to meet some expectation, whether it's your own made up expectation, or it's the expectation you think others have of you to be a certain way or to fulfill a certain duty um, or to have something all together. And you either haven't identified it yet, or you haven't confessed that disconnect between expectation and reality. And so rather than acknowledge that I feel like, you know, you feel it and you sense it and things are out of place, but you haven't taken the time to acknowledge it. I feel insecure about my life because I don't think I measure up in this area. I don't think it, maybe it's my marriage. I don't feel like I measure up in my marriage as a spouse. I feel like I don't measure up in my parenting as a, as a mom or a dad. I feel like I don't measure up in my workplace because I'm not meeting certain targets. I feel like I don't measure up in school because some people it clicks really, you just clicks and other people like I have to study, whatever it is, there's a disconnect. And so you try and, and, and cover it up. And when we cover it up, rather than dealing with it, we begin to operate in pride. And so you're operating in pride to cover up the distance. And this is, this is huge because an honest assessment of where you stand in relation to the image or the expectation that you have or you think other people have will immediately begin to destroy that work of pride. Just because what it is, is we're bringing it into the light. If it's hidden in darkness, the enemy can run rampant with it. And it's hidden in darkness. If you're the only one who knows about it and you're the only one that you're having conversations with about it. And these are simple things. It's not anything like embarrassing or overtly bad. It's just the normal things we deal with in life. And the enemy would keep us bound up in pride because we would be too afraid or, or ashamed to, to admit it. But as soon as we do that, you bring it into the light and there's healing and there's revelation and there's understanding and there's comfort. And you begin to walk out of insecurity where the Lord is tearing down that house. And you begin to walk into security where the Lord is begin. He's speaking to you about it instead. Okay. And then the third one, I'm not going to meddle too much in number three because <laughs> whoa. Okay. Number three is this, the proud can, they struggle with sin. The proud struggle with sin. And I'm going to say unconfessed to sin because we all have sin. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. That's why we need a savior on a daily basis. I don't just one time give my life to Jesus. Every morning I give my life back to Jesus. And every day I confess the sin I have. So the proud struggle with unconfessed sin. Like I said, I'm not going to meddle here. But Proverbs 13, 8 says this. Whoever disregards discipline comes to poverty and shame. But whoever heeds correction is honored. Okay, Proverbs 10, 17. Whoever heeds discipline shows the way to life. But whoever ignores correction leads others astray. And then Proverbs 21, 4. Haughty eyes and a proud heart. The unplowed field of the wicked produces sin. Okay, just peel back the layers here for a minute. Those who are proud cannot confess sin. They cannot do it. A proud person cannot confess sin because confession is an act of humility. Confession is, is an act of humility. So as soon as a person begins to confess, they're no longer operating in pride. They're operating in humility. But if you cannot confess sin, if you cannot see it, you won't acknowledge it. That is pride because 
To confess sin is to humble yourself before the Lord, and it's to agree with his assessment of the situation. A person in pride will not and cannot agree with the Lord. Why? Because a prideful person will contend and rage against the Lord. They will rage against sound judgment. They will not draw near. They will not confess. So when we talk about the, the, the whole series, it's not just knowing. Wisdom is not knowing what is right. It's applying it to your life. The proud person may have boatloads of knowledge about scripture, boatloads of knowledge about the Lord and his goodness and his favor and his blessing. They could teach and teach and talk and talk, but they're not living according to what is good and right. A proud person can do that. First John 1, 8 and 9 says, if this is the only scripture, not out of Proverbs, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us, which means we have to confess that there's sin that we have to. You cannot be proud and stand before the Lord. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is just and he will forgive us our sins and he will purify us from all unrighteousness. So the proud person cannot identify sin in their life. So I'm not going to meddle. I'm not going to meddle. But I'm saying like, if you're like in your life, you're like, I ain't got nothing wrong with me. Like you got all the issues. <laughs> the mirror, you know, put the mirror in front of you. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, because if we stand in pride and we pretend like we don't have sin, if we pretend like we don't have guilt or fault in any situation or any disagreement or any kind of thing like that, we're blocking what the Lord would do in our life. And there is so much he wants to do for the humble. We're going to look at that. But a proud person. Okay. So a person, a uh, proud person cannot identify sin in their life. If they cannot identify sin, then they cannot confess it because in order to confess it, you have to see it. Okay. If they cannot confess it, then they cannot find forgiveness or a right standing with God. I don't know about you guys, but I want right standing with God more than I want to be right about anything else in the world. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't care about being right. I want to be right with God. Okay. So God, and this is what I love so much because God is very, 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 very harsh with the proud. He says he will destroy them. They, they won't. He hates them. He detests proud mockers is what it says. Hear this. God in his infinite wisdom and his infinite goodness tears down the house of the proud and he makes them low. If you've ever been humbled by the Lord, it is a good thing. This is why. So that they might humble themselves and agree with God and find salvation and healing for their souls, because that's what God wants for his people. He wants healing and salvation and restoration for, for his kid. He created all of his people. He wants all of us operating in healing and goodness and self-control and righteousness. He wants favor and like he wants mercy, all of that for all of his kids. And so he will destroy any work of pride in your life. He will make you suffer. He he will make you insecure. He will make you unsure because of his goodness. Hopefully it will drive you into his presence. You will acknowledge him as God. You will acknowledge his goodness. You will bow before him in humility and he will lift you up. He will make you whole. He will make you right. He will restore a sense of peace and security in your life. It is good. And I know I'm talking to a room full of believers today. And so you're like, I don't got any of that. <laughs> but let me tell you, there are days and there are spaces and places where it may not be the whole of your life. But if you feel like you're lacking something good in your life, you're lacking a sense of that goodness, then shine the mirror and ask the Lord, Lord, will you show me the places of pride? Because I want everything that you have for me. And I want that work destroyed in my life because your way is better. Amen. That's good. That's good. So the good news is if at the end of the day, <laughs> You can see places where you have been an arrogant, prideful jerk or jerkette. <laughs> and you can confess that to the people you've sinned against and you can confess it to the Lord. Then the good news is you are learning to operate in humility and you are training yourself in righteousness. However humbling, however humiliating, however embarrassing it may be to get the wheels turning in learning to confess sin and to acknowledge the way that you've been behaving is out of place. The more you do it, the easier it gets. And then you're training yourself for righteousness and you're operating in the ways of the spirit. Okay, let's talk about the humble. You guys ready for the humble? Everybody say the humble. All right, <clears throat> number one, the humble, they learn from others. 
They learn from others. Proverbs 13, 10. I'm repeating a scripture we read earlier. Where there is strife, there is pride. But wisdom is found in those who take advice. Pretty simple. The humble learn from others. <laughs> Proverbs 15, 33. Wisdom's instruction is to fear the Lord and humility comes before honor. So it's simple to operate in humility is to know how to listen and how to hear. To operate in humility is to know how to listen and how to hear. If the prideful person is arguing and debating, then the humble person is listening and desiring to understand. The humble person is not engaging in debate. They are desiring to understand so that they can come to a point of connection. The humble person is looking for a point of connection, not a chance to win. So this is huge. Every conversation or disagreement or argument or places where you find yourself on two sides of a coin, go in with the intent to listen, not to win, not to prove your point, not to make your side heard or known, but to listen and to understand, to find a point of connection. And now you're operating in humility and there will be, there will be blessing and honor and favor for that. It, let me tell you this, it takes humility to be able to hear from someone else and learn something for your own situation. It takes a certain of, amount of humility to do that, to hear someone else's story and learn from it ab about how it can apply to your life. Humble people can learn from anyone. Humble people can learn from anyone. They can learn from kids. They can learn from people they disagree with. They can learn from, they can learn from hostile people. You know, like humble people can learn from anyone. Why? Because there's a genuine belief in their heart that the Lord created all things and he can speak through all things. So whether or not the thing is good or the person is good, the humble person recognizes the mark of God on that person and the fact that God is sovereign over all things. And so the humble person can learn from anything and anyone. And so they have eyes to see and they have ears to hear because they know who their maker is and they know how the earth works. Amen. That's good. Okay. Number two, the humble have God's favor. Say God's favor. The humble have God's favor. Proverbs 16, 7. When the Lord takes pleasure in anyone's way, he causes their enemies to make peace with him. I love that one. And I'm not thinking about people. I'm thinking about stuff. Most of our disruptions to peace don't come from people. They come from an internal struggle somewhere. And the Lord says, when the Lord takes pleasure in anyone's way, he causes their enemies to make peace with them. I believe that even means those internal things. He will cause those disruptions to make peace with you. You will have peace in your life. Proverbs uh, 22, 4. Humility is the fear of the Lord. Its wages are riches and honor and life. And then Proverbs 28, 14, blessed is the one who always trembles before God, but whoever hardens their heart falls into trouble. So the flip side of the coin to operate in humility is to just know and do what pleases the Lord. <laughs> like just know it, know it and do it. You know what I mean? Wisdom is not just knowing it. It's doing it because we either operate in the flesh or we operate in the spirit. You cannot do both at the same time. You're either grieving the spirit or you're making the flesh angry. Remember someone is disappointed. <laughs> God is not disappointed with us, but we grieve his spirit when we please the flesh. And when we, when we please the spirit, we anger the flesh. So to operate in humility is to know and do what pleases the Lord. It's to on purpose, make a choice to make your flesh angry. I'm going to make my flesh angry, but I'm going to honor and bless the Lord. So if the prideful person is striving to keep their image and they're battling with insecurity, then the humble have favor far beyond what they could have achieved in their own strength for some reason. And they can't even define it because they know there have been times in their life where they have dealt with it. But all of a sudden there is a favor. There is a blessing. There is an internal peace upon their life. Why? Because they're operating in humility and there's action to humility. It looks like this. The humble live honestly before the Lord and others. And when they do that, he causes peace in their life. And so there becomes an absence of fear. There's an absence of feeling like you're going to be found out about something because of their own accord, the humble person brings things into the light. The humble person goes to another person and says, Hey, I'm dealing with this. I'm feeling like this. I struggle in this area. I, I, um, I don't see myself this way, but I feel like this is how people see me. And so I'm struggling with it. They have an ongoing dialogue with trusted people in their life and with the Lord. And so they operate in a 
place. They live in a place of humility and there is favor in abundance in their life. There's peace, security, and assurance because their life really is an open book and they've brought it out. They haven't been humbled and exposed. They have exposed themselves and they have found favor. Okay, number three, receive God's mercy. The humble person receives God's mercy. Everybody say God's mercy. Proverbs 28, 13. Whoever conceals their sin does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Proverbs 18, 12. Before a downfall, the heart is haughty, but humility comes before honor. So to live and operate in humility is to live a life of confession. And I've read the scripture hundreds of times, hundreds of times. Um, just kidding. Um, Proverbs, I've read Proverbs a lot, but recently that first one, Proverbs 28, 13, whoever conceals their sin does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces and finds mercy. Okay. <clears throat> Grew up in church, always went to church, loved Jesus, all the things. I've got kids now. And let me tell you, kids love to lie. Okay. Kids love to cover things up. Kids love to hide things and pretend like they didn't happen. Why? Because they're afraid of judgment. They're afraid of being found out. There's already in the, in the bound up in the heart of a child, God in his goodness has put a sense of right and wrong in his people. Okay. And so I, I remember I was sitting on the couch recently with one, I'm not going to out one of my kids. There's one of them. There's only two figured out <clears throat> one of my kids. And I knew like within the past couple of weeks that something had been lied about and covered up. And it wasn't a big thing, but it was just like those, those, those small things are big things because if they're not, if they don't learn now that it is safe to confess, then they become adults or teenagers and they, they hide in darkness. They hide in insecurity. They hide because it is not safe. And the Lord, I don't I wasn't planning on getting weepy, but the Lord wants his people to be safe in confession because he wants them to have favor. He wants them to find mercy and they cannot find mercy unless they confess. And so they cannot be afraid of judgment. They have to be okay with confession. And so it was like a couple weeks later and we were reading, we have a devotional and this scripture came up in the devotional. I was like, praise Jesus. Cause then it gave me an opportunity to talk with my kids. And I said, Hey, do you remember a couple weeks ago when, when this happened and you know, you tried to cover it up and pretend like, like it didn't happen. And they're, they're like, no, that didn't happen. Still, still covering it up. Ah. And I, I read that scripture. I said, God, I, because they know Jesus. They know the Lord. They know the scripture. And I said, Jesus loves you. He gave everything for you. He gave his whole life for you of his own accord on purpose. Whether you choose him or not, he already gave his life for you. And he covers you. And he has so many good things in store for you. But he can't give them to you if you won't confess your sin. If you won't come to him and acknowledge that you need forgiveness, then he can't forgive you. He can't pour out his blessing. He can't pour out his favor. He can't pour out his mercy because you're standing apart. Like you, of your own accord, you're standing apart from him. You're rejecting his goodness. And so it was a big moment and it was a learning like it's okay to confess. It's okay to acknowledge you have sin and then to confess it because the person who does confess finds mercy. They don't find judgment. They don't find judgment. They find mercy. If the prideful person cannot confess sin, the humble are quick to confess it. They're so, like, even if they're confessing everything, you know, even if it's not sin, I confess, I confess. So many times I felt like such a dummy because I've been in a situation and I like later, I'm like, I don't think I acted right. And so I'll text the person I was there with and I'm like, ah, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I, I acted this way and that was kind of weird. I shouldn't have done that. And they're like, I didn't even notice. I'm like, good. But like, they're quick to confess sin, even if you feel like you're so quick to do it. They're quick to agree with God's assessment of their situation, whatever the situation is. They're quick to hear from others and they're quick to share with others what God is doing in their life, even the hard stuff. Why? Because the humble person knows that the Lord's mercy is only found through confession. The only way we get the Lord's mercy 
is to operate in confession and mercy is granted instead of judgment. The humble person knows the danger of holding on to and concealing what God has asked us to get rid of or what God has asked us to share with another person. The prideful person, this is the harsh truth. The prideful person will receive judgment and they will receive the realization of every fear. Be, what, that's real. That's the Holy Spirit ministering to you and saying, if you hold on to that, these things are going to happen to you. But what happens is we, we believe the lie of the enemy that says, I'm going to hold on to it because if I let it go, these things will happen to you. No, 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 no. That's the lie and the deception. The reality is I am, I'm causing fear in your life. I am causing you to wrestle with it so that you will confess it and find mercy instead of that judgment. Remember this, the truth is as Christians, we're people and we're covered by the blood of Jesus, which makes us white as snow. <laughs> That's the good news. God does not stamp us with that label of being impure. He doesn't stamp us with the label of being greedy. He doesn't stamp us with the label of being prideful or foolish, but we do sometimes operate in those things. We choose those things instead of the way of the spirit. And the good news is though, when you see yourself on the wrong side of where you want to be in any situation or relationship or any context, it is so simple to correct it. It is so simple. That is, remember, if we can humble ourselves before the Lord, we confess our sin, we agree with his assessment of the situation, and we turn from that way of life and instead to the Lord's way of life. Amen. Is that a good word to you guys, everyone? This is so simple. I'm just going to go ahead and lead us in a time of prayer. So if you guys would close your eyes and bow your heads. I just want to pray over us. And what I want to do today is I just want to lead us through a, through a prayer of confession. And so father, we first just thank you for your good word to us. Lord. And I thank you for that revelation and that understanding and that seeing in scripture that it is infinite goodness and wisdom, which causes you to rage against the proud person in order that those who are operating in pride, ourselves included, can find mercy and favor, that we would be humbled and find healing and restoration and salvation for our souls. Lord, I thank you for this group of people. I thank you for, for those watching online, those who can hear my voice today. Lord, I thank you that you have, begin to, you have begun to reveal some places in our life in our relationships or in our understanding and the way that we carry ourselves and the way that we behave towards others. Lord, there have been places where we have operated in pride and you are so good to show that to us so that we may renounce it and walk away from it. And so with every eye closed, it's not necessarily a salvation prayer. What I want to do is I just want to, there's an action of, I want to confess the places where I've been proud because I want to let go of that. And I want to operate instead in humility. I want to choose on purpose to live by the spirit and not by the flesh. If that's you, would you just lift your hand with me? I know there's going to be hands across the, the room because we all struggle with this. And so I, amen, I see all of your hands and the Lord is beginning to move already to hear that desire in your heart and to set things right. Amen. I see all of that. So let's just go ahead and, and repeat this with me. If you would, everybody together, father, God, I thank you for your spirit who always leads me before I chose you, you led me, you led me to find you, you led me in humility to choose you. And I know that you're continuing to lead me. I thank you for your Holy spirit. I remember that he's with me always to accomplish your goodwill in my life. And so I submit myself today to your spirit, to your presence, to your sovereignty. You are good. You are awesome. You are mighty. You are powerful. You have good things for me. And I want all of them in my life. Would you continue to lead me by your spirit to do what is right and to have your favor 
and to have your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen.